And now it's my pleasure to introduce Jackie Warnemont. Again, the title of Jackie's talk is. <laughs> Give you a minute to get ready. Uh, performance and the Archive. All right, I'm gonna let my technology do some things here. Ready, set. Um, all right, so the what I'm gonna do today is a little bit of um, kind of overview of some some things that I've been working on, and then I'm gonna I have a, a little participatory uh, activity for us to engage in, and it's gonna seem like a lot of very strange things for a lit professor, right? You'd be like, what? That all seems weird. So if you have questions about how any of it works, let me know. Um, I've kept it relatively informal and relatively compressed so that we can all get on to celebrating and having uh, glorious fun. So uh, right, the title of the talk is Performance in the Archive, and I think the first thing that I have to do is define what I mean by archive. And this is an area of significant uh, discussion, we'll say. Um, right, so a formal definition of an archive is a space that houses primary source documents that are usually considered to be the product of an important person or organization. Um, and it's a product of their legal, uh, commercial, administrative, or social activity. So it, it tends to be the business of them being them, whether it's an organization or the important person. Um, these are generally held uh, to be official documents and material created in the course of official work. So you can have things like personal diaries, etc. You have those for presidents, for example. But because they're presidents, the official diary is considered a record of their work. Um, things held in archives have been carefully, usually curated, uh, selected for long-term preservation. Um, sometimes permanent. Usually people are sort of imagining more just long term rather than permanent because we know that nothing lasts forever. Uh, they are generally held to have enduring cultural or evidentiary value, right? That this is go somebody's going to want to go back and look at this at some point, right? Um, and normally things that are held in archives, at least according to an archivist, are unpublished or unique. Um, and this actually is, is significantly different than, say, a rare book reading room, um, which as a person who works in the 16th and 17th century, right, I go to the Folger Shakespeare Library or the Huntington Library all the time, I'm looking at stuff, it's a wicked old copy, right, of Shakespeare's first folio, but it's not unique. So it's not an archive, those aren't archival materials, those are rare book materials. But things get fuzzy, right, because alongside that holding, right, that the Folger or the Huntington has are also the personal papers mm -hmm. of Shakespeare's contemporaries, right? And so for me, already this, this uh, sort of rigid definition of the archive blurs in my own scholarly practice. So I tend to use the term archive in ways that make archivists pretty uncomfortable, right? I tend to think of it in a kind of unofficial or undisciplined archival way, right? Um, and I, I draw on a couple of people's work in, in this respect, and it's a, it's a deliberate, um, it's a deliberate act that I think is both political, right? I think it has a certain kind of ethics aligned with it, um, but it's also epistemological. It's about knowing histories in different ways. Right, so for Carolyn Steedman, um, who has this fantastic book called Dust, um, the archive has become a metaphor capacious enough to encompass the whole of modern information technology. And for Steedman, right, um, part of the, the impetus of Dust is to say the archives of the people who have been excluded from Look, the locus of power, right? People who are considered unofficial, so women, people of color, queer people, etc. Um, those archives, she argues, are found in things like homes, right? In the junk drawers, in the rugs, in the personal effects in someone's attic, right? Not necessarily the, the official documents of an important person, but important for us telling history nevertheless. Um, Deb Verhoeven, who is a scholar in Australia, uh, she's a cinema scholar, argues that archives are social and technological infrastructure, right? And I think thinking about what it is that we need, what kinds of tools do we need, what kinds of stories do we need in order to coexist with one another, anything that facilitates that, according to Verhoeven, is an archive. Um, so the, we keep getting this capaciousness. And then the last person is a, a performance uh, theorist and performer named Diana Taylor. Uh, and she has been really important for me in thinking about performance in particular. She says, there's an advantage to thinking about a repertoire performed through dance, 
theater, song, ritual, witnessing, healing practices, memory paths, and the many other forms of repeatable behaviors that cannot be housed or contained in an archive. Right, so Taylor is interested in um, what dances can tell us about memory, how we can reconstruct social bonds through ritual, what kinds of embodied behaviors are not necessarily housed in an old, old fashioned archive. So I've been doing some of this work with a collaborator whose name is Jessica Ryko, who's in the uh, theater and dance uh, program over in um, Herberger. And we've been thinking about data shed. So when we talk about data shed, we're talking about like the amount of data that comes off of any one of our mobile devices in just the normal everyday actions that we're, we're engaging in. Right, and we wanna know, right, because this is a thing, right? We, we very often don't have a good sense for how much information is sort of flowing out from our devices on a regular basis, and we don't know who's capturing it and why. So we've been working on this idea of data shed and thinking about what would it be like if we could feel information, right? Um, and here I'm, I'm sort of making a connection between information and archives and thinking about sort of modern emerging digital archives also. Um, and if we could feel information, would it change our relationship to both how we understand what it means, but also how we store it? So what you see here is um, one of three sculptural pieces that we um, co-produced with a, a local artist. Um, and the, the three pieces were first shown at the Mesa Spark Festival, which is an arts and technology festival. Um, and they vibrate, they have large um, subwoofers embedded in them, and we wrote an app um, that takes the data that's coming off of that person's phone, turns it into a song, essentially, and then plays it through those subwoofers, making this thing vibrate with the person's data shed, right? So that they have some sense, they have a, a tactile, embodied sense of how much data is coming off of their phone at any given time. <coughs> Um, so that's one thing that we've done. We've also been thinking about um, sort of touching an archive, right? So and this goes back to a more historical archive. Um, thinking about how information sharing through touch, maybe even sound, although uh, perhaps less so because that's a, a, a more well-trod space. But how does touch, how might we think about touching an archive, right? There are these, Derrida talks about the experience of archive fever, right, of going in and like literally breathing in the dust from archival documents and maybe even becoming a little sick, um, right? But there's also, you know, people very often talk about this material experience of being in this dusty, quiet, old space, and there's a certain kind of gravitas there, right? Well, what would it mean if we took the data of an archive or a digital archive and had a different kind of touch-based experience with it? So what you see here is a presentation that I did at the University of Kansas's uh, Digital Humanities Center. And there's a very thin red metal wire that everyone is touching right now. And what they're feeling is a data set about the history of <laughs> eugenics. So eugenic sterilization, sterilization of people for what was considered legal uh, categories of mental deficiency so that they wouldn't taint the gene pool. Uh, this happened between the 19 teens and the 1960s. Um, and in this particular data set, they're feeling eugenics data um, for the state of California. And this is a way of engaging with an archive such that you have to, you, you feel the traces of people's sterilization histories in your fingers, right? Which is a slightly strange thing to have happen. But it's, it's a way for me to get that story out because those records are um, protected under what are known as HIPAA uh, regulations. So the Health Information Privacy and Portability Act, which says that I can't reveal people's medical information, right? So I can't just publish those archival documents, but what I can do is let you feel them in some way. So that's a, one other way that we've been feeling the archive. Um, here, this is a, you know, we're thinking very much about bodies, right? Our, the archive as an idea, right, it, it has a material presence, but it's also always produced by people. There's this crazy, in the library science, a crazy quote from the 1940s that essentially um, archival documents are the secretions of an organism, which just like kind of creeps me out, right? Like <laughs> secretions of an organism. Um, but if you're thinking about a, a corporate organism or something like that, it's like the stuff that, that, that just comes off every day. So it's like the data shed of an organization or an important person. 
So Jessica and I are interested in sort of returning to the bodies that make those secretions uh, in, in um, some sort of interesting and important ways. So the question here is, are there ways that we can engage archives that care for and honor those bodies, the human bodies, the corporate bodies, the legal bodies, rather than simply exploit them? So working on a, a kind of non-parasitic scholarly model. And what you see here is something uh, that was called data play, where we had five different haptic experiences, that's the touch base, um, at the University of Michigan. Um, and these here are uh, vibrating balls, large beach balls that I stick a small vibrating speaker in, a, a, another subsonic uh, speaker that you'll see here in a minute, um, and then the balls vibrate. And it was an interesting way to think about caring for an archival collection by literally holding it and then feeling it. So uh, what we're gonna do today, the, the sort of participatory thing that you're gonna feel if you choose is um, grounded in tracking death. I'm super interested in like how we count dead people. I wanna know why we count dead people. I wanna know how we do it. I wanna know why we do it in words. In some places, I wanna think about the material forms, right? So I have up here for you an example of one of the early texts that we use for tracking death, right? Which are parish registers. This is in England in the uh, 16th and 17th century. This is actually the parish register that uh, records William Shakespeare's burial. So this right here it, on April 25th is the burial of Will Shakespeare gentleman right there. Um, and this was how we originally, at least in the Anglo-American uh, tradition, tracked death. You then get in the 17th century innovations, and this is late 17th, early 18th century, um, in mortality statistics, life tables, census tables, etc. John Grant is the guy who sort of first creates a life table, and what he's done here is he's gathered all the, the hand collected or individually collected records of plague deaths. Plague sweeps through London four times in the 1660s, it's a big problem, lots of people dying. He puts it all together in this table, and this is the, the sort of foundation for statistical science, for um, population studies, right? For a whole set of things that we do now, for things like insurance, right? Uh, our life expectancy, et cetera. And then we have things like this, which is a more modern instance of counting dead people. So this is uh, iraqbodycount.org. Um, which is a website that collects the number of deaths reported by multiple agencies, so it's, it's fact-checked in some way, um, during the long arc of the Iraq War. <coughs> and the thing um, that I have for you today is a sonification and a haptification of this data set. And part of what I want to encourage everyone to think about is what is it, how is it different to think about death in this media form that media form, that one, and all of these are very visual. They're textual in a lot of ways, right? But then in the form that I'm gonna present it now. So, I have here a strange thing that I have crocheted. Jessica and I do a lot of crocheting with very strange, large crochet things. Uh, including paracord. This is not paracord. Paracord is the stuff that you climb with, so we have a, a really large net that you could actually hang people from if you wanted to. And by hang, I don't mean like hang them by their necks. I mean like people could be suspended up in them, dancers. Um, so if you all wouldn't mind, or some of you, those of you who would like, I'd like to encourage you to come up and hold parts of this rope. And I will say, that this is not necessarily the happiest thing that you've ever felt in the world. So if you feel like this is gonna cause problems for you, by all means, stay seated. See if I can actually get it to go, what do you think? But yeah, you can. It's on it, but it's not every day. Shock all of us here in a second. It's okay, it's not there yet. Nothing's happening yet. Yeah, you might have. Yeah, I thought that Why, Fawn, why? <laughs> it's a little seancey, right? Like, oh, y'all guys, I need to people. 
So one of the things that we're actually <laughs> interested in, and pardon me while I pull up SoundCloud again because it seems to have had a minor failing. Um, one of the things that we're interested in is oh, okay. this communal aspect, right? What it is to gather around and feel something. Um, all right, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So there's room for more people to come and touch if you'd like. People look like they're at church. <laughs> I kind of like the idea that people look like they're at a church, right? Elizabeth. Because this is a kind of witnessing. Elizabeth. This is a witnessing, I'm witnessing from here, <laughs> right? It's a it's a witnessing with your body or with your eyes, which is part of your body, right? Um, oh. Accounts of people dying. That's a, that's a big deal, um, right? So it it doesn't bother me at all that it feels a little solemn, um, but I'm also really intrigued by people's body position when they do it, um, people's affect when they do it. So this represents which data? This is a sonification of that graph that you see, or of the data that made that graph up there. So that visualization is the count of uh, mortalities from violence from 2003 to 2016. Would it be possible to read just by touching this? Could you interpret the data by touch? So this is an interesting question, right? Is this only an affective thing or is this an informational thing? And I think it depends a little bit on how um, fine-tuned we can get the haptics, right? Because this is still pretty in, in the prototype phase. Um, but you can definitely tell degrees of difference, especially if I stop talking and you listen quietly. If you look at it with a thing, it's also right a little bit more informative. Um, but if you guys will keep holding that, I'm going to come over here. I'm going to try not to drop my phone in the hummus. <laughs> I'm going to sit here, here. here. I can hold it. Yeah. It's stronger. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Right. And there are interesting questions, right, about like how much you all are dampening the signal for one another. Um, how much the the um, rope is a good conductor. That's what we think. It's much stronger up here. So this is the sound that you're feeling. That part's not going anymore? Yeah, the vibrates. You're like, no, the vibrating went away. This is also one of those things, right? Devices are Oh, there you go. Did it go again? Okay. Oh, so it, can't, it doesn't, it it doesn't can't like having sound. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think we get the idea. Yeah. Right, so there are different notes, um, right? Essentially what's happening is that I have mapped the values onto sonic space, right? Um, and so then it, it plays with the vibration here. Sorry, <laughs> All right. Thank you all for coming up and participating. Um, one of the things that I hope that you'll do after this is tell me how you found that. And maybe we can talk about that a little bit in the, the Q&A. I do have one last slide, um, right? which is uh, Rebecca Snyder has this amazing book called Performing Remains. She's interested in uh, reenactments of war, but also sort of like how we can perform uh, what, it, what the status of death and dead bodies is for us in um, Anglo-American culture. And um, I have taken from her this quote that I think applies very well to this sort of general sense of archival work, which is archives and archival work, is a, I think of them as a thing which nets us all in these knotty and porous relationships to time, a performance of a temporal tangle. And I think there's an interesting way, right, in which the material of the, the tangle, right, um, and the net that you just felt sort of tries to make that metaphor that she's using rather literal. I will stop there and we can have a discussion. 
How did people? Uh, <laughs> how did people find that as a participatory experience? Interesting. Yeah. Interesting in what way? I think it's really interesting that it's a cool medium. Or cool, maybe that's not the right word. It's a medium that kind of helps you understand information, mm -hmm. but it's also a medium that is like that's like almost useless without other information. Mm -hmm. Visual or like you, you have to inform somebody what they're actually feeling. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when it comes to like archival data, it's the only archival data that needs something else attached to it. Because I can look at a graph or somebody can like tell me something, or I can mm -hmm. read something, mm -hmm. but if you tell me to just feel something, it doesn't mean anything unless I have the information that comes with it. Right, so it needs a certain kind of context in some way, which yeah, goes, it needs more context. I think in else. part to your question, David, right, like could we just like get the information? I wonder, do you think it affords you anything that seeing the data or hearing or like reading the data does not? I'm not sure. Okay. I'll answer that question. I didn't go up and touch it, but I can tell you um, that the actual like physical feeling of it probably makes it a little bit more personal mm -hmm. as opposed to just looking at a graph. Mm -hmm. You would feel like more of a connection. Okay, well, that's every time I felt that, that meant something, whether it was a death or mm -hmm. depending on the data you chose. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit more personal. Right. I mean, it's it's it, it leaves a trace in your body, mm -hmm. right? Which is a, a different kind of thing, which isn't to say that reading doesn't. Um, but I think there's something about the way that reading, we imagine reading is not an embodied practice, right? That this kind of pushes against. In some ways, it kind of almost reminded me of like the the ultrasound practice where uh, parents can hear their child's heartbeat, mm -hmm. it, except kind of like the opposite. Instead of feeling life, we're feeling death. Um, but in a lot of ways, it had a similar emotional experience. Like, this is something that's really hap that's really happened. This this is real. This is tangible. Mm -hmm. So it takes a thing, right? I mean, I, that's an interesting metaphor, right? Because mm -hmm. part of the reason people like to hear heartbeats or see pictures of ultrasounds, or even once uh, a baby starts moving, right, feel the kicks, mm -hmm. is because it can seem very abstract, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when you can feel it, it stops being quite so abstract, right? So you put it as that makes it real, and I think that's a that's a very interesting way of, of thinking about it. Thank you. Yeah. I feel that it, it leads to additional archives in a way that seems to, for me, uh, jog memories mm -hmm. that I may have forgotten, mm -hmm. uh, and that could lead to, uh, like in this account, just uh, you know some additional information that may not have been revealed by just skimming a page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a kind of a um, both a memory aid, right, which is interesting since archives are in part about remembering, right, um, but also a push out into other spaces. Yeah. Thank you. David. Is it a form of synesthesia in the sense that visual data is being represented in tactile form, so it's crossing the boundaries between the senses? Yes. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. d definitely. And I think, right, so the um, I left this one up so that you could sort of see it as a, a kind of map. But this is not the, like, the, we don't take the visual, like, the visualization. We don't take the graph as the data, right? We take the, the long tables that have the deaths recounted in them. Um, so we have a numeration, but even that, right, a text is always still visual, yeah. right? So yeah. it absolutely is a, a kind of move. And it... It's interesting to me, and I don't quite yet know what I think about it, but it moves first from the visual textual into the oral, because I, it becomes a sound file before it becomes something that you feel, right? And then into the tactile. Yeah. And you can have all three at once, or you can pull them apart. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's something very interesting about engaging multiple senses there. So how do you adopt the data to an oral sound or just different frequencies are going down into the, the tactile feeling of it. How do you transpose those from just numbers into you know frequency of vibration? Right. So the um, the total span of the data right is mapped into the sonic space from one to negative one, um, which is how speakers right the the yeah. frequency right. Um, so it, that breaks up essentially, if a graph here goes up to 4,000, right, we just map that into that same space. So that 4,000 hertz or, or how are you? 
So in, into the audible range. Okay. 4,000 hertz wouldn't be audible, would it? It is, yes. It is? Okay. Um, so this is actually something, if it sounds like maybe you know a fair amount about music stuff? A little bit, yeah. Okay. Um, so I have someone who helped me develop the program, um, who is himself a, a music, uh, a digital music creator. Um, so I know a little bit less about this than he would. Um, but. So far as I understand it, it maps it into that sonic space, right? And then I have a set of instruments, and it, to be honest, I'm using GarageBand, right? Because oh, yeah. this is like, I'm super hacking everything right now. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not a musician at all. And so um, part of what I'm doing is um, optimizing the instrument choice and the um, note range for both audibility and feelability, right? So there are some notes that are too high to register on something. This is called a Wooger, this little device. Okay. Um, some notes are too high to register in the Wooger as vibration, and so if I want them to register, I have to bring the whole thing down. Um, and I've also flipped it so that the highest um, values resonate the most strongly. Does that help? Yeah. 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 <coughs> One question that I, and, and you may not have an answer for this, but one thing that's an interesting consideration to make is that you've achieved a way of assigning a human life uh, an oral frequency. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's interesting to consider like what a, uh, you know, depending on the scale or the scope or the number, what a human death could potentially sound like. And mm -hmm. in terms of your like the, the haptic generative components of, of the technology, I suppose it's worth considering like what song that might sound like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you put that in a really in a in a very lovely way. The one thing that I would work on for myself, trying to understand, is um, being very precise about what is represented. Right. So. You phrased it as, um, a, you know, mapped a sound onto a human life. Sure. And there's a part of me that wants to say, no, only the event of the death. Sure. Right? And, and only even the event of someone else recording the death. Right? So, like, there's a part of me that wants to be really precise about that. Yeah. Um, right? Because one of the things that I struggle with when I think about sort of, like, quantifying technologies or other kinds of abstractions is, like, how far are you abstracting away from the, like the insane complexity of human life, right? Absolutely, yeah. um, but I think that, that that way of saying like you have you have given a sound and kind of like numerical range for an event that is a, a I don't know if I want to call it a catastrophic event, but right, like that's a major life event. I think um, tragedy is probably an apt description. Yeah. yeah so that that's a that's a thing. But thank you for that. Yeah. Totally. You had a thought. Yeah, um, I think answering that question, so the, the heavier sounds, the lowest sounds are the most deaths. Mm -hmm. And so after hearing that and kind of experiencing it, um, that's what I would feel. You, you feel it in the rope and then it, looking at it visually, is, it's just, it's cognitive. It's not, there's no visceral feeling, but when you feel it in the rope, I think that's kind of what, what Jordan was saying too. It's, it's assigning some, some sort of reaction, reactionary feeling to it. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. I had someone at the the one where we had the thin red wire, she said she felt infinitely more implicated, right? Because yeah. she was gonna walk away and remember in ways that she wouldn't have otherwise. So there, I think there's something interesting there about like how we remember the things we learn also, right? Yeah. Could you elaborate on your research for tracking death? Because you mentioned <coughs> marginalized groups mm -hmm. and I'm thinking of enslaved people mm -hmm. who would not have had those types of documented archives to document death. Mm -hmm. And then would it be different if you're using different, the sound, the sonic, be different if you're using different archival artifacts? Yeah. In other words, not to have a very nice, neat group of statistics. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, my question is twofold. Yeah. Your research, and then how do you account for non-traditional archives? Yeah. Uh, so those are both great questions. The um, in terms of my research, I would say that I so I, 
I have a very broad interest in how we count dead people and then what we do with that, right? Um, and it actually started with an account of the partition of India, um, in which the deaths uh, during the partition sort of spasm were counted um, and tracked not accurately, right? This is a thing also I think that's worth noting, like the plague deaths, also not necessarily accurate, right? So we're dealing with a fiction in many ways. Um, and then people went back and wrote novels out of the, the uh, partition death numbers. So um, insofar as I'm sort of generally interested in how we count dead people and why we count dead people, there's definitely a, a strong underlying interest in who gets counted and how do they get counted. So for example, um, looking at military mortalities, um, in the early modern period, only nobles were counted. None of the sort of foot soldiers of any particular group were counted. Um, so the, the, un, the counts are actually really undercounted, right? Because you're just counting the, the people who have some status. And that's partly because death counts are originally a way of um, making an account, a, a transaction between the British crown and the landholders, right? They owed them money. Um, so, you know, we see that not everybody gets counted, not everybody gets counted in the same way, and you're absolutely right in the case of enslaved people, right, when we try to look for their own collective counting of deaths, we won't have it, right, because they weren't permitted to do that. So I have been looking at things like um, slave ship manifests, which is a, a place that lots of historians have gone, but also... Um, the wills, the property wills of slave owners, right? Because that's where you most often get that kind of recording. Because, and I think this is really interesting, right? Because what they're doing is not counting dead people, they're counting the money lost because of someone's death, right? The perceived loss. And so that's not, it's not a commensurate number with something like the, the counting of the death of a, of a free person in the United States. So the, that number, means differently. And I don't yet know what it would mean to put that together in a, a kind of sonic or haptic experience. Um, I think there's I think there's questions about not only the media, but the veracity. And then I think there's probably something worth doing around um, unofficial counts. Um, so whether those be narrative stories, um, whether those be population estimates, um, right? Because there are a number of gaps there. But I wouldn't want to just flatten the difference between the different archival types. Um, so I don't know yet, I think is, is part of the, the answer. The book um, that I'm working on right now that deals with the quantifying of death and other things, um, right, is being written as a, a relatively traditional book, and I haven't yet started to do this in with that material. Does that answer your question? I think it does, and I think it would be really interesting to be able to eventually quantify, <coughs> if not qualify, the sonic response to traditional mm -hmm. body counts compared to non-traditional body counts. Yeah. Because it's the qualitative, I think, and quantitative intersecting when you don't have an exact, an exact official count, right. so then you have to go into the narrative of the death. Right, right, and try to somehow trans and remediate that, yeah, right, or translate exactly. it. I think it would be really yeah. interesting, and I want to follow you on that. Sure, yeah. I think, you know, one of the things, I'll say this in the context of the eugenics project, um, one of the things that I've learned, and we've seen this in other spaces, for example, you know, you have white poets making art out of black death, and, and right, like, Issues of cultural appropriation and artistry are, um, I think they're, they're, they're very sensitive in this space, right? So in the eugenics work that I've been doing, we initially, so the data set, 20,000 people sterilized uh, in California um, and Latina women were three times as likely to be sterilized as any other pop member of the population. Um, so we know that there's a strong racial and gender bias. We did a sonification and a haptification of that specific data set and in different places, it's been received very differently, right? So in some places, going back to the idea of memory, right? Um, there have been some scholars here who said, wow, that reminds me that like, I lived right up against that particular uh, hospital in California, and I remember seeing those people, et cetera, et cetera. 
Other people have said, I don't know, man, you look like a white girl making out art of brown people's pain. And that is not a thing I want to do, right? Um, so trying to figure out how to negotiate that, um, I think is very important. And I think it's partly about um, maybe reaching out and letting other people do some of that work them, like with my help, right? And saying, what are the things that you want? Like, how would you sonify this? This isn't mine to make aesthetic. This is yours to make aesthetic, right? Um, but I don't know. I, if you ever have any thoughts about that, I would welcome them. <laughs> any other questions? Yeah. I had a quick one, and it kind of goes, um, so when you translate data into sound, is there like a specific, like not regulated, but like generally accepted way to do that? Because if there isn't, and the way you are interpreting this and taking data and making it into sound, wouldn't that have like a huge impact on like how we're going to perceive it? Oh, for sure. So when it comes to like the high death counts being like that low rumble, like she said, now would we feel it or perceive it different if maybe it was like the opposite? Sure you like. So and when we archive data, like so do you think there should be like an accepted way to... Are you asking me if I think there there ought to be an objective way of sonifying data? Yeah, yeah. No. But I also don't think there's an objective way of making an archive, right? I, I tend to think that any representation of information is already curated and crafted and rhetorical. Mm -hmm. And so I'm pretty comfortable with the rhetorical features of this. And, and I think it's important to acknowledge that they exist, yeah. right? And to say like, yeah, I intentionally flipped it so that the greater deaths resonate at that lower level. Um, and be transparent about that, but I, I don't worry about trying to make it objective. Yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you all for coming.